and open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and the title of the message there, it's on your notes, Controlled by the Gospel. Controlled by the Gospel. We are looking at the great Christmas songs of the past. These songs that were written hundreds of years ago, and we still sing them today. I think that if you write a song, and people are still singing it 400 years later, you've written a pretty good song. I don't see too many people singing Who Let the Dogs Out 400 years from now. But we're going to talk about this song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I love this song. I love this song because if of all the Christmas songs that we sing, this one has the most Christological theology of all the songs. That was two heavy words that really just mean the, this song tells you a lot about who Jesus is and what he did. Theology packed. Packed with the good news of the gospel. And we need to be people who remember that we are the people of the good news of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the church is not a bunch of to do's. The Bible is not here to just try to help you be a better person. The Bible is here to tell you how God has accomplished the work to make you into a brand new person. Not a better version of yourself, a redefined version of yourself, a child of the living God. And it has been accomplished for you in Christ. It is so important that we sing songs, friends, that teach us about Jesus, not just emotively cause us to respond to Jesus. I'm always telling our, our worship team, please don't just sing touchy-feely worship songs for the people. I call them Jesus makeout music. <laughs> you, know what I, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of Christian songs out there and, and they're all about the emotive qualities of our faith. Like, I just love the Lord, love, la, 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 and he loves me, la, 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 la. And there's no like information about this. What's happened in Jesus? What did God do for us at the cross? We have to pronounce in song and in spoken word the finished work of Jesus Christ so that the next generation knows what to believe and respond accordingly. Amen. And that's what I love about this song. Now, the funny thing about this song is written by Charles Wesley in the 1700s. Charles Wesley was a songwriter. He wrote over 6,500 songs. Not many have survived all these years, but this one has. He had a brother named John Wesley. John Wesley was one of the great revivalist preachers of this, entire, of this country's history. Uh, he traveled up and down the East Coast uh, preaching the gospel during the great awakenings of this country and brought the gospel all over the country. But anyway, Charles Wesley writes this song, Hark the Herald Angels. The first line originally written by Charles Wesley, the hymn writer, was... Hark how all the welkin rings. Now, I know what you're thinking. What the heck is a welkin? <laughs> well, a welkin is a firmament or the firmament. And I know what you're thinking now. What the heck is a firmament? <laughs> the firmament is the heaven above us, the sky, the sun, the stars, all those things above us. That's the firmament of heaven. We don't use these words anymore. Well, he writes this song first, and he says, Hark how all the welkin rings. In other words, the firmament of heaven, how all the welkin rings to the glory of God. But, but his brother John, the preacher, said, Charles, I think you're off base here with this first line. That does not make sense for future generations. So he scribbled out, Hark the herald angels sing, gave it to Charles, and Charles put it, on the, put it into the lyrics of the song. How many know some singers need some preachers to help them out of their mess sometimes? Hallelujah. <laughs> but anyway, beyond that, beyond that phrase, this song is deep with the work of Jesus. I just wanted to kind of like, recap the words for you today before we get into this. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ, the everlasting Lord. And then it talks about the deity of Christ. Veiled, incarnate, uh, veiled in flesh that God had seen. Hail the incarnate deity. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lay his glory by. What did Jesus do? He was in the beginning with God, and he laid aside his glory as God and took on human flesh in a baby born to a poor couple in the middle of Bethlehem and became nothing for you and for me so that by his poverty we might become rich in him. He laid his glory aside, and then he was born that men no more may die. 
born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Notice how glory and response come after hearing what Jesus has done. This is why we don't just sing emotional songs. we got to sing instructional songs. Because listen, we're emotional people, but many of us don't get this. Our emotions are affected by the information we receive. Did you catch that? You're not just emotional by happenstance. You're emotional because you receive information. If you go to the doctor and he says, I don't like the look of that mole or that lump. Let me take a test. Immediately your emotions go one way. And then if he calls you back a week later and says, everything's negative, your emotions suddenly become positive. And what I'm telling you is that the information that you receive changed the emotions that you had. This is very good news for you because it means you don't have to be the subject of your emotions. You don't have to be victimized by how you feel. You can change how you feel. And the gospel is good news. And one thing about good news is that good news changes how you feel. I want you to write this down in your notes. This is the first blanks. When you get the gospel, it changes how you feel. The gospel is not to do, to do, to do. Be better, try harder, work harder. God is waiting for you to make the mark, uh, make the grade match his expectations of you. No, the gospel is good news that Jesus Christ has done it for you. Accomplished at the cross. It is finished. Jesus said, and it changes how you feel. We all know this in Christmas time because when we open a present, it's like getting information. And based on the present, the information either makes us glad or it makes us mad. <laughs> you, you know, you guys will be doing this in a few weeks. You'll be opening presents. Not the dads, but everybody else will be opening presents. <laughs> you ever get a present that's just low? Like, ooh, what the heck were they thinking? <laughs> I remember when I was 12 years old. When I was 12 years old, I was into He-Man and Transformers. It was very easy. Everybody asked me, what do you want? He-Man, Transformers. Go shopping. Right? And, and, and so my aunt, God bless her, love her with all my heart, but she bought me a present, and I remember I was unwrapping it, and my cousin was sitting there watching me, and I unwrapped the present. I'm so excited. What He-Man character did she get me? And I open it up, and there's this box, and on the box is a picture of ceramic clowns. And I thought, well, surely my aunt is playing one of those practical joke Christmas gifts on me. I'm going to open the box, and in the box is going to be He-Man. So I open the box, and I pull out the paper, and I pull out what's in the box. Guess what's there? Ceramic clowns. <laughs> and as I look at the ceramic clowns, I can hear my cousin watch my face, and she's looking at me, and she's laughing, and she's shouting at the top of her lungs, he hates them, he hates them. And I'm like, no, auntie, I love them. Thank you so much. <laughs> anyway, I re-wrapped them up and re-gifted them to my mother that year. But anyway, <laughs> you get some news and it changes how you feel. The gospel is good news. It's meant to change how you feel. That when you open up the good news of the gospel, when you get back to the cross, my friend, when you remember what Jesus has done for you, it should change your emotions. It should lift your spirits. It should cause you to cry out with the herald. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. I'm so thankful for what Jesus has done for me. And the gospel... At the end of the day, it's about one thing. It's about reconciliation. Amen. So in our passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, is, is, is that famous word that Paul's going to use in this passage, reconciled, reconciling, reconciliation. From that great line, peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean? So it helps us change how we feel. We've got to know what it means. What is reconciliation? It's on your notes there. What is reconciliation? Reconciliation is the restoration of friendly relations to former enemies. Restoration of friendly relations to former enemies. Now, here is what people don't understand. That before Jesus, we are at odds with God. The natural, um, the natural state of man's heart toward God is animosity. It is. We don't, we don't think so, but it is. Because here's the deal. We don't want to serve the God of the Bible naturally. We want to serve the God of our own imaginations. 
Many people are comfortable with a God of their own idea. Me and God have an agreement. He's okay with the things that I do. And he looks the other way. Really? Where is that written down? Jesus is the fullest expression of the, of the true God of the universe. He is the, the God that is no longer a figment of our imagination. He is God in flesh. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Now, now, isn't it funny, even in our culture, people have no problem with God. Even Muslims have no problem with God. Hindus have no problem with God or gods. But when God becomes Jesus, now the rubber has hit the road. Because Jesus is fixed. Jesus is a clear representation of what God is like. And that's why when you're talking about faith with people and you talk about God, they're cool with you. But the moment you bring up Jesus, they're like, now don't go getting crazy on me. Are you hearing me? And so what you have to understand is that we are at odds with God. That's the animosity. That's the inherent animosity in our hearts where we make God out of our own making. Augustine said it well. He said, in the beginning, God created man in his likeness, and ever since, man has been repaying the favor, been casting God in our likeness and making God what we want him to be. That's just animosity. That's just latent animosity. We are at odds with God. This is why people don't want to come to church. They don't want to to think about the Bible. They don't want to think about what God demands and expects of them or, or, or requires of them because they're at odds with God. They want to run from God. Our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, ate the fruit, ran from God. They've been, they, they've been, we've been doing that in a thousand different ways in a thousand different places ever since. And what you have to understand is that Jesus came and jumped over the wall of hostility. He came to us. We didn't go to him. He came to us. And at the cross, he had demolished and destroyed that wall of hostility between us and God so that the wall comes down through his blood and we can come back to God in peace and have right relationship with the maker of the universe and live the way we should. So this is what Paul's going to talk about. And then he's going to talk about how do we unpack this for our lives? Why does this matter? Why does it matter that God and sinners are reconciled? That's the subject today. Would you stand with me as we read from 2 Corinthians 5? And here's what he says in verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others by, but I'm sorry, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known to your conscience as well. We are not commending ourselves to you again. But we are giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, but if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised again. Now from now on, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, there it is, and gave us, The ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. What does that mean? Not counting their trespasses and sins against them and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Five times he says reconciled. In this passage, for our sake, he made him, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is his word. Would we pray together, ask him to open our eyes and hearts to hear it. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that your words will be clear today, that I will speak what you want me to speak and nothing that you don't want me to speak. May our ears be open. May our hearts be receptive. May our souls be stirred by the reality of the good news of the gospel. And may we see Jesus and him only. In his mighty name we pray. And everybody said, 
Amen. God bless you. Have a seat. I want you to note the line from Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. Can I ask you a question? What is your controlling influence? What is your controlling influence? We all have one. If it is not the love of Christ for us, it will be some other love that we're searching for and looking to. Something's going to vie for control if it's not God in your life. Now, when we think about controlling influences, some of you think about substance abuse. So you think about drug addicts or alcoholics. And yeah, that's true. But one thing you will note about Waters Church is that we do not have a 12-step program. It is not that we are against 12-step programs. It is just that we don't want to cordon off to one little corner of the church the people who have controlling influences in their life as if it's only drug addicts and alcoholics who have a controlling influence in their life. Everybody has some kind of substance abuse. Right, we are all in recovery. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tim, and I'm a substance abuser. <laughs> I need somebody to help me out of my addictive qualities. You ever hear somebody say, I have an addictive personality? Welcome to the club. Yeah, right? We're all addicted to something. It just might not be drugs and alcohol. Some of us are addicted to dad's approval. Everything that we're doing is because we want to make dad either glad or mad. Amen. We want to prove him wrong or prove him right. And we're controlled by that, I don't know, dysfunctional or, or, or somewhat functional relationship based on our past. It's a controlling influence. Some of us are people pleasers. We want to please everybody. We want to make peace. We think we're peacemakers. No, we're trying to just be peacekeepers. And we're appeasing everybody in our life, trying as, as hard as we can to make everybody like us. What are we doing? We are serving a controlling influence. Some of us are controlled by money. We're controlled by status. We're controlled by influence in our world or in our communities. We've got we to gotta be in charge of the neighborhood. We've got to tell the new people moving in what to do with their lawns so that they slivel, level up to the level that we want them to live to so that they are accepted into our little club. Something will control you if it is not the controlling love of Jesus. Some of us are controlled by materialism. We can't stop purchasing. Our credit cards are maxed. We have no money. We are controlled by having and getting and buying, and we can't stop buying. We go so far as to buy ceramic clowns for our nephews. <laughs> controlling influences. What's controlling you? If it not be God, it will be something else. Watch yourself here. And Paul says, look, Corinthians, I want you to know that Christ's love for me is what controls me. You have to understand in the context of 2 Corinthians is that he's talking about his opponents. In fact, the whole book of 2 Corinthians is a letter from the Apostle Paul to a little church in the first century called, in the city of Corinth in Greece. And he's writing to them because this little church that he planted, okay, Paul planted the church. They had gotten so smart they didn't need Paul anymore. And uh, they started to question Paul's credentials. And they started questioning Paul's, you know, influence or, or who Paul was and if he was even an apostle. And so he has to defend himself and kind of prove to them that, 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 that he's, he's, he's who he is by God's grace. And what had happened in Corinth is that they had become seduced by these itinerant preachers who had come along and, and wowed the crowds with their oratory and speaking skills and their spiritual gifts and their letters of recommendation and, and all the things that they had, all their little resumes and all the things that they said, this is what's making us important. And Paul levels them. He levels them. He doesn't level them by saying that's not important. What he says is, I am not important by what I accomplish. I'm important because of what Jesus accomplished for me, the love of Christ controls me. Where they were controlled by importance. You ever meet a Christian who's controlled by being important? You ever meet these I can't stand these Christians. I, these Christians, they want status. They want power. They want influence. They want position. I always get a little bit, I, I sniff the devil when I smell those Christians. 
That's exactly what the devil wanted in heaven. He wanted to be in the place of God. He wanted importance. He wanted recognition. Just being created in the image of God was not enough for him. He wanted something more. He wanted to be worshipped. There's a lot of Christians and a lot of churches just like him. We're not called to our own importance. We're called to declare the importance of him, him who died for us. And when we get that, we're, we're free. Listen, when you get controlled by the love of Jesus, the control of all those other things that you might be tempted to serve are not nearly as important anymore. I want you to get here. I want you to get to that point where you are controlled only and ever by the love of Jesus because it'll free you. Three realities when you're controlled by the love of God, then we're done. Number one, when I'm controlled by the love of God, no pretense is required. And this is what Paul is saying, because look what he says. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we'll talk about that in a moment. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. In other words, we know what we're trying to do because we fear God. And then he says, but what we are is known to God. In other words, we are known to God. It doesn't matter what you know about us. Christians, if you can get this in your spirit, I'm telling you, you will be free this holiday season. You won't have to impress people. You won't have to work so hard to put on the masks that we all wear to make sure other people are okay with us. He says, what we are is known to God. I don't care what you want us to be. I don't care what you think of me. I know who I am in Jesus. That's what Paul's saying here. Now, the word pretense, let's talk about that. We get another word from the word pretense. It sounds a lot like pretense. It's called pretend. How many of us are pretending every day of our lives? <laughs> pretending we're better people than we really are. Pretending that we have more money than we really do. Pretending that people uh, like us more than they really do like us. Or pretending that we have the perfect American family. When if anybody was just in the car on the way to church with you, they'd know the truth. Come on, you know it's the classic American tale. You're screaming your head off at the kid all the way to church. Shut up! Shut up or I'm going to kill you! I'm going to kill you! I swear I'm going to kill you! I'm going to kill you! You come through the doors of church. You're like, how you doing? God bless you. Good to see you. I love you so much. It's so good to be here. Pretending. Putting on the faces. Let me, let me give you another word for that comes from pretense. Pretentious. Pretentious, I have the definition up here, attempting to impress by affecting greater importance, talent, or culture than is actually possessed. Pretentious. I want you to think well of me, so I, I put on a show. I, tell you, I don't tell you about my problems. I only tell you about my victories. Facebook feed is filled with pretentiousness. I only put my highlights. My husband shoveled the driveway today. <laughs> he is such a, an amazing man. <laughs> Last night you had a knife in your hand and you were threatening him. <laughs> that didn't make it on the Facebook, did it? <laughs> Pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gotta get back to what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, let me break down the word, too, because the word is a two-part word, pre and tense. Pre is the prefix for what? Before. And tense is a synonym for stress. What do you stress before others? In other words, before you get to know me, I want to stress who I really am, who I want you to think I am. Before you get to really know who I am, I want, you to, I want to stress this. It's, it's, the, it's the image of a, of, a, of a muscle man who's about to take a picture of himself, so he pre-stresses his... I'd do it for you, but my shirt would rip. And he, and he, <laughs> see, that's pretentious right there. Do you see that? You see it? Everybody's got it. All right. Anyway, he pretenses so that you think he's stronger than he really is. This is where the, 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 the gym selfies come from. This is where the locker room selfies come from. Um, people taking locker room selfies. We don't want to see it. Just go to the locker room, do your deal, and get out. I don't understand this. 
Want to see my abs in the bathroom? You want to see my abs? No! No, we don't. <laughs> Stop it! Most of us have got a keg. Leave us alone. I don't have a six-pack. Pretense. I want to stress this before, before you find out the truth about me. And Paul says, I don't need to do that with you, Corinthians. I know you're in love with all these, you know, itinerant preachers. I know you think they're so special. I know you think you're, you're taken, you're wowed by their performance. But listen, it just shows me that you've lost touch with the gospel because the gospel roots you in the finished work of Jesus, God, for you. You don't need to perform for others. You don't need to put on a show. It frees you, friend. It frees you. No pretense is required when you're rooted in the love of God. And so a little bit earlier than verse 11, he says in verse 10, look what he says. We didn't read this, but I want to put it up on the screen. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be received what is due him, what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Okay, what I love about this, right before saying that the love of Christ controls us, Paul says, we also have a judgment seat waiting for us. And what I love about the Apostle Paul is that he models for us what I call a perfectly balanced Christian reality. That a Christian sits perfectly placed right in between two poles. On one side is the love of God, and on the other side is the judgment of God. Mind you, no Christian will be judged for their sins. They will be judged for what they did or did not do in the name of Christ. Paul says, I live right in between. I am, a, I am secure in the love of God, and I am also motivated by my fear of God. Now, what I find is that Christians go to one extreme or the other. There are the love party, the love party people. These are the people who love Jesus' make-out music. It's all about loving Jesus. He loves me. He doesn't really worry about my sins. He just loves, he loves, love. I just swim in the love of God. So God's so good. And he's okay with the things that I can't change. Where'd you hear that? And then there's the judgment party. These are the insufferable ones. They're always <laughs> pointing out your sin. And, and you always find the judgment party are classic, classic two-facers because they're always pointing out the very sins in others that they themselves commit. That's why you always see a pastor who's condemning one particular sin in America, and suddenly you come out, the news comes out, and he's been doing it the whole time. Judgment party. And Paul says, I'm right in the middle. Because I know he is the lover of my soul. He loves me with an everlasting love. No one can pluck me from his hand. Nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I absolutely believe that. But I also believe he's the judge of all the living and the dead. And I live with healthy, holy fear of the God who formed me and created me. Please get yourself to this point because you might be veering one way or the other. Some people say, I don't like fear of God. Fear of God. I don't want to fear God. Listen, there's something called healthy fear. Yes. And you have healthy fear in relationships with all the people in your life that are significant to you. I have a healthy fear of my wife, Cheryl. <laughs> no, 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 trust me. It's healthy. I fear letting her down. I fear not being honest with her. Whenever I spend a lot of money, she'll tell you this, whenever I spend a lot of money on a toy, I can't get away with not telling her. <laughs> I have to tell her. She's got to know that I've spent this money because I can't live with myself if I don't. But it's a healthy fear that I, that I, need, to, I need to make sure that she can trust me, that our relationship is Trust work as healthy. I value her, and therefore I have a healthy fear of her opinion of me. You have a healthy fear of every person in your life that is significant. And I would suggest that if you have no healthy fear of God, it's because you have not yet made God the most significant person in your life. If he's God, if he's creator, if he's originator, if he's the former, if he's the lover of your soul, you will live with healthy fear and say, Lord, I don't want to let you down. 
I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to do things that you're not okay with because you formed me and you made me and you loved me and you made me to live a certain way. And so, yes, I know you love me, but I also know you're watching over me and you want to protect me from my own self and my own issues. So, God, I live in the fear of the Lord that I've got something to do to honor you. That's a healthy Christian balance, friend. Because if you don't fear God more than anything, you'll fear other people more than God. So here's, here's what you need to get to. No pretense required. Number two, when the love of God controls me, no person is insignificant. And this is further what Paul says because he says, from now on. What does he mean by from now on? From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. What is he talking about? In other, he says, another translation says this, says, says it like this. We, we, we see no one um, the same way anymore. We, we don't see anyone from a worldly perspective. And then he says, even though we once regarded Christ this way, we don't anymore. What Paul says is, I have learned to see people totally differently because I have learned to see Jesus rightly. When I see Jesus for who he is and what he has done for me, I no longer have to see any human being as my enemy. Hear what Paul the Apostle is saying. Remember Paul before Jesus got him? Remember Paul before Jesus got a hold of him? Everybody was his enemy. He hated Christians. He wanted to persecute them and jail them and kill them. Jesus got a hold of him and suddenly he loves everybody. He never uses the word enemy to refer to another human being ever in the entire New Testament. This was a man who wanted to kill us. That's the power of the gospel. Because the power of the gospel teaches you that Jesus laid down his life for people. You and everybody who's the least like you as well. And I want you to get to this point so that you get to the, to, the, to, the, to the place in your life where you can start to see other people as significant in the eyes of God. And see every human as someone for whom Jesus shed his blood. Do you understand how important this is in 21st century America? In in politically divided America? In racially tensioned America? In socioeconomic blame game America? In right left America, conservative liberal America, Democrat Republican America, Donald Trump divided America. We have got to get beyond these petty differences that are common to the heart of humans and realize that we were saved by our enemy, therefore we have no enemies. So I want you to write this, the gospel changes how we see Jesus, it also changes how we see others. Christian, you never come eyeball to eyeball with an ordinary person. You come eyeball to eyeball with someone for whom Jesus shed his blood. This might help you at the Christmas dinner table. (laughs) When your antagonistic brother wants to bring up politics and get you riled, and get you all flustered, and so that you actually maybe blurt out a little swear word along the way, and then he comes back at you with, so that's what Christians do. Right? If you can see him for somebody who Christ died, you'll ignore the political arguments and you'll do your best to be somebody that they can see the love of Jesus in. It's a much better place to be. This is what Paul says. Before I saw Jesus for who he was, I saw everybody as my enemies, as people who I had odds with. No. Friends, if you're a Christian, There's only two people on the planet now. For every Christian, there's only two kinds of people on the planet. People who are in Jesus and people who need Jesus. That's how the Christian sees people. The Christian doesn't see race and ethnicity as a divider. The Christian does not see uh, social class as a divider. The Christian does not see political class as a divider. The Christian sees people who need Jesus or people who have Jesus. That's the people of the world. And and it's so liberating because it just helps you relationally align with God first and then with everybody else next. We don't love our neighbor 
as we love ourselves until the love that we have for God is properly aligned and properly rooted in the finished work of Jesus for us. Everything flows from that. So then he says this in verse 18. All this is from God. All this is from God, he says, who reconciled us through Christ to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Skip to verse 19. That is, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins or trespasses or debts against them and entrusting us to us the message of reconciliation. Listen to that line. What does it mean to be reconciled to God? He no longer holds your sins against you. That's what it means. Jesus bore your sins on the cross. And, and the scripture says that God casts our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Corey Ten Boom, who survived the Holocaust, a, Jewish, uh, uh, a Dutch lady who survived the Holocaust because her family would hide the Jews and they were arrested and thrown in Auschwitz. She wrote an amazing book, The Hiding Place, but she, she said it like this, God casts our sins into the sea of forgetfulness and then posts a sign saying, no fishing allowed. I love that. <laughs> in other words, God doesn't dig up your sins, don't you do it. He doesn't pull them out of his back pocket in the last minute right before you want to ask him for something. No, no, wait, wait, remember what you did last Christmas, remember? He casts them in his He doesn't hold your sins against you. Why is this important, Pastor? Why are you hammering this? Because if you don't catch that God doesn't hold your sins against you, you will hold the sins of others against them. This is where unforgiveness comes from. This is where resentment comes from. This is where I'm not talking to them anymore comes from. Because you, ha you haven't rooted yourself in the fact that God has forgiven you. And what he means by forgiven is that he doesn't hold it against you anymore. And you're in right relationship with him. And he has done that not just so you can get to heaven, but so that you can live at peace with people on earth. And stop keeping records. Oh, some of you, you're like spiritual accountants with everybody in your life. I remember what they did, and I'm going to write that down. I remember what he did, and I'm going to write that down. I remember what they did. And you're like a little accountant, just a little accountant. But if God, if God ever brought your record books out, whoa, Nelly, watch out, right? Shred the, le shred the ledger, friend. Shred the ledger through the blood of Jesus that shredded yours so that you can start living at peace with people because life is way too short to hold all these records against everybody. It's when the love of God controls me, no person is insignificant. Number three, when the love of God controls me, no announcement is more important than the gospel. Announcement. The gospel is not to do, the gospel is good news. Changes how you feel, changes how you live. So Paul says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. And then he said, we implore you. Oh, that word, you know, when you pull out the implore, you really mean it. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So Christian, what we do is we spread the message. There's no more important message to spread than the message that God is here to save sinners and love people, no matter how awful they've been in the past. This is the message of the gospel. And then Paul wraps up the argument by saying, look, for our sake, verse 21, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin on that cross, even though he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, God took the sins of the world, placed it on his son. The suffering, the shame, the loneliness, the isolation, the separation from God, Remember what he says on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that you could be accepted. He, he, he endured 
separation from God so that you could be reunited with God. And then he takes the righteousness of Jesus, his righteousness, and he puts it on you and credits you with the goodness of Jesus. This is why you should never fear praying to your father if you're in Christ, ever. Because you come not in your righteous record, you come in the righteous record of Jesus. That's the power of the gospel, friend. No message is more important. I think about a world in which a video of a rabbit being saved from a fire in California and a starving polar bear circles the nation in a hot second and how our hearts go out to animals and yeah, rightly so, that's wonderful. But I want to tell you, no message and no work is more important than the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Because we'll never care for creation properly until we realize that our creator loves us fully. We'll never care for people who are not like us until we realize that we were nothing like God and he cared for us anyway. That's the power of the gospel. This past week, a church made headlines. The church made headlines because it had a nativity in Massachusetts, by the way, and a nativity. And outside in the nativity, it has signs of all the mass shooting locations of the last 20 years with the numbers of the people who died in those mass shootings next to the location. And it was around Mary and the, and the baby Jesus and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men. And it was right there. And on the front of the nativity was the, was the passage from Luke 19, 42. If only you knew the things that make for peace. Jesus said that. So they interviewed the church because this made headlines. This is Massachusetts. They said, Pastor, what's the meaning of this nativity sign? And I thought, wow, what a perfect opportunity to have the gospel come out. Come on, yeah, tell them. And unfortunately, he didn't. He said, we as a church are very troubled by the stagnation of gun control legislation in this country. I appreciate the sentiment for peace, friend. I really do. But you got to understand something. The message of Christianity is not gun control. And when Jesus said, if you only knew the things that make for peace, he wasn't talking about legislation. He was talking about his shed blood. He was on the way to the cross. And he's saying, if you only knew, if you only knew that it was my blood that could save you, if you only knew it was my blood that could put the odd relationship between you and God at rest for eternity, you'd know the peace that no man can give you, the peace that comes from God. I want to say that, uh, that New England, it's not the problem that we don't have enough churches. It's that we have too many churches who have forgotten the gospel. This is what we're here to preach. This is what we're here to proclaim. Peace on earth and mercy mild. Why? God and sinners reconciled through Jesus. And when that happens, we'll have a lot to sing about.